powerful people, influencers, powerful people and influencers to share their stories, to let us know that it's not always just this fortunate set of, set of circumstances that aid in people's success. Most times it's like hard, hard work. My name is R.W. Jones. I'm the president of Can I Live? We're a national tenants association, public housing tenants association. And we are former welfare moms who have worked ourselves out. And we are here on a mission to move a million moms of welfare. And we do that through having a plethora of programs such as our resident owned business incubator where we're teaching entrepreneurs, under-resourced entrepreneurs, how to get and secure the bag, long-term build generational wealth um, particularly in the public housing arena because there's so many empowering programs for those that are assisted by HUD funds. But not just public housing, but anyone low income. Um, we have a Section 3 marketplace that we're looking to connect all of these um, opportunities. There are opportunities that Section 3 affords, and many people know what Section 8 is, but many people don't know what Section 3 is. So as we are on this mission to move a million moms of welfare, we know that you can't move moms of welfare without dressing the needs of fathers. And so we're here, we actually are in an RV wrap traveling in the United States. And we're here just really trying to say, how do we connect these powerful stories to our programs, to the people, to the contractors, to the business community, so we can all kind of work together towards this concerted goal. And so um, we're really excited about, you know, the new funding that we got here in DC. Shout out to the DC government. I am big on policymakers. I'm big on, you know, when funding is allowed to come into a city or state and help entrepreneurs, you know, access their, their dreams. And so they just recently funded our um, work readiness program, which we're excited about because we're giving families a professional makeover, which we'll talk to you a little bit more about later. But that professional makeover is, of course, you get a resume, LinkedIn profile, headshot, cover letter, um, and you have to be a DC resident to do that. So if you guys, and it's paid, all of our training that we're having right now is paid training. And so, you know, you'll hear more about that in a little bit. But until then, I think Denise is going to play a reel for us to at least get the excitement going into our speaker. We can't hear the sound, Denise. You're muted. Sorry about that, you guys. Well, we might have to bypass that, the, the video and just get right to it. You sure? Ah, I'm sure. That's the beauty okay. of our entertainment. That's the beauty of entertainment. That's the beauty of life. It's, it's not always scripted. Yeah. But, if you're, but if you're prepared, it doesn't matter. You know? Can't you hear it? No. He's already. He, we, so listen, without further ado, everyone, <laughs> Mr. Matthew knows he is here on the floor and, you know, already dropping dimes right from the gate. Everything don't always go according to plan. So Dr. Knowles, welcome to our Lunch and Lessons Learned. We're so excited to have you here. And the fact, look at that leadership. You just jump right in. Well, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. First of all, I am so excited about being here. It's 9, 10 in the morning here. Um, I want to give you guys a story of success and what people who really want to be the very best at something. So most would think, well, he just showed up this morning and he's going to talk to us. No, yesterday I was in Rome, Italy. I traveled for 18 hours yesterday. I got home here, my wife and I in California at 7 p.m. We left at we got up at 5 a.m. and there's an eight hour time difference. We went to Chicago, went through drama, 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 and finally got here. And last night, tired, 
but I'm fueled by passion. And, and we'll talk about what that means when you live your passion. So I'm fueled by passion. I only do things I'm passionate about. You're not quite at that level yet, but we're gonna walk through it because I believe there's greatness in each and every one of you, but you have to believe it. So what I did last night, it's 22 steps from my bedroom to my office. I got on the computer and I began to research and research and research and understand what Can I Live Incorporated meant and Raquel, how proud I am of your leadership. And it's something that I read and I just wanna share it that, that you had on your site. If not stop, this vicious, vicious cycle of poverty will continue for generations to come. Criminal activities induced by poverty will rise. Mental health depression will increase and toxic and strained relationships will remain stagnant. And as I began to look at that site more and more and the things that you're doing for, for women and moms and the community and students. And when we think about poverty, there's also a definition in my research I found called mental poverty. Simply an impoverished, and by impoverished, we mean problem, problem solving or lack of, memory or lack of, concentration or lack of concentration. So when we talk of mental poverty, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of living for some of us. It's a condition and state of mind where there are limited educational resources, limited educational resources. And if there are educational resources, one chooses, one chooses to avoid them. One chooses to refuse to change and adapt and to modify behavior. So that's a decision that a lot of us make. Some of us think of poverty, that financial lack of the 20%, 19.5% of blacks in America that live at a certain income below the poverty line, but we never talk about, a lot of us think we have mental poverty. It's how we think, it's how we've been conditioned, it's how our lack of who and what we believe in ourselves. So that's why, and thank you, Denise, and, and thank Bay Atlantic University for your support of this. Because I believe it all starts with education and knowledge. And, and I'll tell you my story, but I do want to show you this slide. Because, I mean, I was up, I went to bed about two this morning. I woke up about five this morning thinking about this. What am I going to say? Because I like for it to come from my heart, but I want to be prepared for whatever the situation is. So I put together this one slide that I just want to show you because I think it clearly gives you an understanding of where we are and why education is so, so important. If you see there in the core, education and knowledge. See, we get confused sometimes, and I say this to all my academia, world, we get confused that education and knowledge is the same thing. See, education and knowledge are two different things. My dad only had third grade education, but he had the knowledge of how to be a mechanic. He had the knowledge of how to be a professional, professional truck driver. He had the knowledge of how to tear down houses 
and sell the copper and the metals. He had the knowledge of entrepreneurship. And, and I'm very proud when I see the university has a graduate entrepreneurship course. And, and so when we look at education and knowledge, you can go to, you can get, take a course on being an electrician. You don't have to get a degree always to get knowledge. And I, I think as we grow Black America, and academic Denia has to also understand that we have to support knowledge, that everyone's not going to college, but we have to give them the opportunity to, to gain knowledge. Because those that have education, and when you combine both, which, the, which is the ideal situation, when you combine both, you know, I meet folks with wealth all the time. And I assure you, the majority of them have education and knowledge. Unfortunately, I meet a number of people that are impoverished, that have lack of education and lack of knowledge. And when you do, these are the things that happen. When you have lack of education and lack of knowledge, it affects your critical thinking, it affects your belief system of who you are, the confidence, it affects your housing, how you live. It affects your income because if you don't have education and knowledge, you're gonna have a low income, which is gonna bring you to the poverty line. It's gonna affect you with the criminal justice system. You're not gonna have money to get an attorney. Your critical thinking is gonna have you driving in the wrong neighborhood at one o'clock in the morning with your music turned up with your one of your lights out. That's poor critical thinking. It's going to affect your health and wellness. It, it's, it's not happenstance that when you look at the black community and, and you look at a poverty rate, well, only 15% of the population, 15, 16, 16% of the population but we're almost 50% of the poverty. We, we have the largest, not 50%, but we have the largest poverty rate in America. And that's because of the lack of education and knowledge. So all of this ties together. And that's why I wanted to show you this, is when you don't have the education and you don't have the knowledge, that critical thinking piece, that critical thinking piece really, really becomes tarnished. So I want to look at you now. I want you looking at a slide. I just want to talk. I just want to look at you and take a minute to just evaluate. I get energy just, I have the, just to give you context, I made a major investment in my studio. I have this huge screen that allows me to see, it's 54 of you. I see 40 of you on one screen. And then I can hit a button and see the rest. Can we take us back to the main screen there? There we go. There we go. So I can see, is it Dorante? and Science, and Chase, and Jordan, and Isaiah, Yade, Yardi, Noor. I, don't, I, might, I might have messed that up, brother. I'm sorry. I see Brendan, Latoya. I see Nal and Sam. I see you. I want you to know I see you. Let's see who's on that other page. I want to see everybody. There we go. So, so, so what if? I'm, I'm always teaching. Anyone who knows me know I'm always teaching. So what if I did my presentation today with my camera off? How would that make you feel if I gave my whole talk today with my camera off? Think about that for a second. How would that make you feel that the person 
came, took the time out of their day, but then he turned his camera off. So I want you to know how that makes us feel when we lecture, when we speak, and we're looking at just a name and not a face, not even a photo. It's just a respect thing. I keep it real, folks. What you see is what you get. And on this page, I ain't getting a whole lot. Let's see what I'm getting on this page. The same. So I'll, I'll go back to the first page where, where the people were. There we go. That's right. Let them get it, get him, get him, Dr. Knowles. Get him. I'm just, this is life. I mean, you know, this is real life. You know, it's this, real. Is how, this is how life is. You know, you guys have been bamboozled and bs and lied to. And you wonder why you don't get ahead. It's these little things. That's why I took the time to tell you the journey that I didn't just wake up today and say, hey, I'm going to just roll up here and just start talking. I wanted to research you because you are that important to me. You are that important to me that I wanted to understand my audience. I wanted to understand what Can I Live is all about. So I'll tell you my story. I'm 70 years old. I know I don't look it. <laughs> At least right. I got one. But I'm 70, <laughs> I'm 70 years old. I uh, was born in Gaston, Alabama. Uh, now, I want you, I want to draw this and paint this picture. So we're talking 1952. 1952, shortly after, you know, war, we were desegregation, we had Black Panthers, Martin Luther King, Congress of Racial Equality. We had mm -hmm. Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, those really tough states where Black people were getting beaten and killed daily. So I was born in 1952 in Gaston. My parents, we lived on a dirt road. A dirt road. And ironically, ironically, my former wife and my friend Tina Knowles grew up on a dirt road also. So imagine Beyonce and Salon's mom and dad grew up on the dirt road. Mine's went a little further. We, we had an outhouse. I know you're too young to understand what the hell is an outhouse. Well, that means our plumbing didn't work in our bathroom. So we had to go outside. That's how I grew up in Gaston, Alabama. But let me tell you something. My mother only went to the 11th grade, but as my, my wife now, however, comma, she went to high school with Coretta King and also Andrew, Andrew Young's wife in Marion, Alabama. Those were her classmates. So my mom, 5'11", didn't take no stuff was a leader in the desegregation and integration movement in Gaston, Alabama. My dad, he always would tell the story. First day he went to, went to the third grade and the first day in third grade, the books didn't arrive. The second day, the teacher didn't show up. And the third day, the building caught on fire. So he only went to the third grade. Wow. That's where I came from. And I'm sitting here, a multimillionaire, talking to you, grew up on a dirt road with outside of with our house. I'm here to tell you, it can be done. You can make this transition. 
and understand it's not the destination that's important. It's the journey that you take. And how many times you get off of the wrong and get on the wrong highway? That GPS gives us wrong information sometimes. You know what your GPS is? That social media that you do. That's your GPS that gives you false information most of the time. Just say that again. Most of the time it's giving you false information. And, and so growing up in Gaston, Alabama, um, I never went to a black school. I, imagine that, dirt road, outhouse, poor parents, but not, they weren't mentally poor. They were mentally rich. Mm -hmm. and, I never, and I never went to a white school, a black school. Elementary school, junior high school, Gaston High School, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Integrated those schools. I've been beaten, electric prodded, spit on, called every name you can imagine as a child. And not just me, many others, so that you could be here today. Is that you could have a different way of life. Did you say electric product? Like they, like they, do, like they do cattle. Wow. That's what, that's what the Alabama state troopers use to control the crowd, electric products. And they didn't care if you were kids or old people. They made no difference to them. They, in the midst of the outbreak, they treated everyone the same. So, so let so, me ask you this, Dr. Knowles. In those moments, did you ever think one day I'm going to change this or one day this is not my situation forever? What was like your thoughts going through all of those things? Well, at that moment, you try to survive. Right. You know, let's be real. When, when you get beaten and there's an outbreak and everybody's running and there's chaos, your only thoughts then are survival. Right. There were there were points in my life, and I, I, I'll answer that, but it's later on in my story I want to answer. So, okay. so, so growing up again, I, I because I'm tall, I'm six four, I was the black kid that the junior high basketball coach just assumed I could play basketball because I was the only black kid and I was 6'4". I couldn't play basketball. I was quite frankly awful at it. But I practiced and I practiced and I practiced and I got better and better and I practiced and I practiced until I became really good at it. Got a scholarship and 40 others, but went to the University of Tennessee was on championship high school teams, championship college teams, and, and then transferred for my first time to a black school, Fisk University, where I uh, graduated, got my undergrad graduate degrees. I'd never been to a black, a black school before. It was a transition for me. So I just want to tell my story so when we get to questions and answers, you can understand that my story is somewhat different. My parents refused. My mother, I've heard her say a thousand times, I am not getting government subsidy. They were proud black people. Mm -hmm. my, my dad made $30 a week driving a truck as a a, a, a truck driver for a produce company, $30 a week. He convinced those white folks, could he keep that truck? And that's when he would go tear down old houses. And, and that's when he would sell all the copper and metals. And that's when he would buy old cars and tow them to our house and sell all of the parts. My mother was a colored maid in Gaston, Alabama. I used to remember the white woman would come pick up my mother. 
I didn't understand as a kid, my mother would sit in the back and get, I, well, why, why would my mother sit in the back and this white woman would pick up? I couldn't understand that. My mother made $3 a day, folks. $3 a day as a colored maid. However, comma, as my wife would say, she convinced that white woman and all of her friends, any hand-me-downs, to please give them to her. And on the weekend, my mother and two other friends of hers would be in their living room making these beautiful quilts. So my parents were entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They made more on their entrepreneurial jobs 20, 30, 40 times more. And they convinced, they convinced the people that was really doing them wrong, they convinced them to provide the assets. My dad convinced them to provide the truck. My mom convinced them to provide the apparel she needed to make the quilts. Think about that. How genius that was. And so that's where I come from. That's that mental poverty that a lot of black and brown people in America today, we live in that mental poverty. We've been culturally conditioned. Mm -hmm. Culturally conditioned. And so then I went on to corporate America, went to Xerox Corporation, got a job, and just briefly because there's messages here. So happy hour now in Houston, Texas. And a bunch of black young men on Fridays, we get together, happy hours, downtown Houston. We get all dressed up for the ladies. And so here I am talking with, you know, seven to eight of my, my brothers. And, and about an hour later, this little short white man comes up to me, pulls me to the side and he says, uh, you know, introduces himself and he says, I've been listening to you. I've been listening to you guys for over an hour. How would you like to come and work at Xerox? Because you're a leader. And that's how I got my job at that time, the number one corporation for black people to work in in America, Xerox Corporation. That's how I got my job there. See that from my head, there you go. So the message inside of that is you never know who's listening. You never know who's listening. Went on with Xerox, worked 10 years in the medical division of Xerox, uh, became the number one sales rep in the world, became the number one sales rep in the world, put in the work to be the very best. You know, I teach uh, last semester, I taught at, co taught at Cornell, uh, I start next Saturday <clears throat> here in, in Los Angeles, uh, Point Blank Music School. Also start at Pep Pepperdine. Uh, I lecture at Harvard. And, and everything I tell my students, my 19 year in the classroom, went years ago and got my MBA and PhD. Uh, the one thing that I personally teach is critical thinking critical thinking and greatness. You know, if you want to be good, I always say, don't come back to my class. Not the, not the right class if you just want to be good. If you want to be great, I can teach that. I can help you with that. <clears throat> so that's, that's my story. The music part of it, you guys know. You all know the, that music part of it. So let's open it, if you like, for questions and answers. Yeah, so I was, um, I have a couple of questions. So just for the audience, we're going to be able to have a Q&A session with you guys. Um, but I have some specific questions for Dr. Knowles in our Lunch and Lessons Learn, because when you were telling your story, you I wrote a couple of things down. And you said that your father asked if you could, if he could keep the van. And then your mother asked, if she could have the hand-me-downs. So the first thing that was common is they asked. You have not, because you asked not. So, you know, the mere fact that they opened their mouth to even ask. And then you were sit, you were at this 
place and then this guy comes over to you because he's listening so do you think that i guess my first question is after listening to what we would call the rags to riches story would you say that some of your some of the biggest what would you say some of the biggest misconceptions are that people have about you and the work that you've done or where you come from yeah, I can't. I can't speak for what misconception that people have of me. I, you know, I'm a black man in America, uh, and when you're in a leadership role as a black man in America, um, the media uh, always position black men in a different way, a different light uh, than they would a, a, a white man of the same have, having the same type of accomplishments. So just like I think the Democratic Party, a lot of misinformation and messaging, uh, I think that happens to not only myself, but other black men and women. Um, the messaging that's done by the media is often not, not accurate. Uh, I, I hear a lot of people always surprised. They don't know I'm this tall. <laughs> they they uh, don't know I'm this age and they, are surprised to know that I'm this smart. Uh, and that's one thing I always get, it's like, wow, I had no idea that he was that smart. Well, it's all about strategy. And, and even when you, when I talk about my parents, that was strategy. Yes, they asked, but they first had to have a strategy for why they asked for the truck. He asked for the truck because his strategy was he needed a vehicle so that he could accomplish his goal of making additional income. And he knew exactly what his product was going to be. And the same with my mother. Let me share with a, a story about my grandfather, Dave Hogue, Marion, Alabama. My grandfather had 300 acres of land. Unfortunately, like black families often do in those years in the South, especially, it was two brothers, two sisters. And when my grandmother and grandfather died, they got into this major argument and, and sued each other. Two sisters, two sued two brothers. Ended up with nothing. Uh, but my, my grandfather was the first mm. black man that I ever heard a white man call Mr. Mr. Dave Hogue. My grandfather had the 300 acres of land. He would partial off a hundred that he would sell to the local paper mill. Cause you know, the little small towns, that was a big thing, paper mills, making paper. Think about that. He would lease off, lease a hundred acres. They would come and tear the tree take the trees down, and my grandfather was a farmer. So in essence, my grandfather was smart enough to come up with this strategy that you are going to pay me to clear my land, and then I'm going to then come behind you and farm. Absolutely genius. And I can go to both sides of my family, you know, entrepreneurs, on, on both sides of my family, uh, ed educated. Um, on my father's side, my dad didn't have the lowest level of education, but his brothers and sisters, educated folks, proud folks. So I believe in strategy. I don't know if I answered the question, uh, but- No, you, you know, did, you did. You did. Um, I guess what I would like, I guess I'm always perplexed as back then, they did not have the internet. They did not have, they were not even making the same amount of money. What is it so different back then than today? When you talk about mental poverty, which I totally agree, what are we missing today? How is it that we could be what I sometimes think worse off than when they were back then? Oh, are we, what I, I, are I, we I, missing? I, I think they, that, that family value was uh, somewhat different back then. True. Uh, work ethics were a lot different back then. Um, 
as a young child, I, 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 I failed to mention this. As a young child, I picked cotton. As a young yeah. child, I picked tomatoes, 25 cents a, a foot tub. That's how much we got paid for picking a bucket of tomatoes. Uh, mm. So there was those work ethics and everyone pitched in in that, in that black family. Uh, there were no such thing as just sitting around going into my room playing a video game. Uh, so in some ways, technology in some ways has hurt us, quite frankly. The difference is we didn't, as you said, we didn't have the technology. And my, my main concern is as we go to the metaverse in the future 10 years from now, we're gonna have a generation of young people who are stuck in their rooms and, and, and lose mm. all social skills. Right. And all of this is, is, is conditioned. All of this is thought out and planned, just like social media. I sat in meetings years ago at Sony when the, the thought of social media and how it would manipulate young people. And, and some of it's good. Not all, not all, not all is bad. Wow. But a lot of manipulation happens in social media. And, and you're thinking that you're conversing and communicating and we're conditioned and we have already planted this conversation and planted the way we want it to end. Wow. So what would you suggest for, you see where we're going with the metaverse, you see technology morphing every single day iPhones from uh, you got. I mean, how do we? What what tools or steps could we take as younger people to just maybe take a step back every now and again, just to make sure we don't just dive head in to the well, point I of think, singularity uh, or whatever. I, I think what's happened is that we don't research. We hear something or see something. Uh, online or social media, and we just take it and run with it like it's that. Like right now, for example, we think we're headed in this huge financial disaster, a recession, when in fact today it was announced that in the month of June there was 275,000 new jobs. 275,000 new jobs. And, and the unemployment rate is at a low of 3.5%. But yeah, we think it's a recession because somebody said it. And well, it rises a little. Yeah. Nobody says, well, let's take a moment. Let's research that. Let's not just take that person's word for it. It's kind of like the word African American. Jeff, Jesse Jackson said it in a speech in 1988, and everybody took that word. I'm an African-American. Well, if you ever been to Africa, like I have many times, you know that most Africans really look down on that word African-Americans. You would not hear most, I don't, I've never met an African that lives in America that calls himself African-American. I'm a black man, but we just take things just like, I remember in the day still so now, you know, people go to church and as they walk out, they put up their finger. Not knowing that during slavery, that meant when the master had his, his, his workers in the back with the shotguns and you had to walk out when you wanted to use the bathroom and they had a sheet of paper, they would mark you off and you had to raise your finger so that he knew how many people were missing. And so people just raise their finger, not knowing why they do it. We do a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. We just do it not knowing why do why, why the hell are you doing that? It's crazy. <laughs> why are you why are you saying that? <laughs> you know. That's true. That's true. Well, it takes moments like these for people to even tell us how this stuff even originated. Because we don't even, like you said, we don't really know sometimes why we do what we're doing um so here's my, my next question what was the biggest challenge that you could say 
I had to overcome, the biggest challenge that you ever faced? Driving while black, flying <laughs> while black, eating while bl black. Seriously. Sleeping while black, working while black. Uh, that, that's been a thing for me to, to, to overcome. And there's a thing, this is an unspoken thing. Uh, and I'm very vocal about this, even more so now. When you see the visuals and you see our government and you see the visual of what that looks like, the state level, mm. local level, national, old white men are losing their power in America. Old white men who great grandfathers four generations ago was slave owners. And the world younger white and brown and black generations have come together. I'm proud of you. You're not seeing color the same way. And so when a black man interacts with a white man, there's a lot of friction there. Nobody mm -hmm. speaks about it. It's an unspoken thing. And a lot of black, white men are intimidated by men like me. Hmm. I'm sure you probably get that a lot in your, you know, on your on the level in which you are. I don't know. I do, but the key is to be prepared. Don't get emotional because the moment you get emotional, you lose. I used to tell my students, you can challenge mm -hmm. me. I want my students to challenge me in the classroom, please. But just know, I'm going to hit your button and make you get emotional about it. And you're going to lose because once you get emotional, you're not thinking intellectual. You're thinking just from the heart and feelings and feelings and feelings. Yeah. Uh, and smart people don't do that. Smart people keep their cool uh, and they know how to sometimes punch and hit those buttons to, to get you off track. Now, listen, I'm over here like, mm. some of the people who work with me, they probably like, Raquel, you need to be listening to that. Um, so what, I mean, I'm not asking any of the questions on the paper, Dr. Knowles, because your stories just got me riled up well, in a whole I, bunch of... Let's just have a conversation. I love just having Amen. a conversation. As a matter of fact, I'm going to pull my chair up. We're just going to have a conversation. I appreciate that. I appreciate you taking time out your day and, you know, just sharing some wisdom. 70 years old, you look great. Come yeah, on now, mother. 70. Thank you. I want to look like that 70. I know Thank folks you. at 50 look like they ready for the call. Well, thank oh, you. My God. Uh, you know, for me, and, and on that note, you might not know some of you, I'm a cancer survivor. Three years ago, I was diagnosed with, with cancer. And as you saw on that education and knowledge, uh, a lot, why is it? If you look at the numbers, black men have, have the highest mortality rate. When you look at major disease, we die much sooner than anyone. Uh, only is it uh, breast cancer and suicide, suicide rates. Why is it black women have such a high mortality rate of breast cancer? Why do we have such a high rate of heart disease and diabetes? That all goes back to health and wellness and knowledge and power and understanding that you have to make lifestyle changes. And fortunate for me, I didn't tell you guys, you know, you know, it's interesting. You said, what is one of the things that people don't know? Again, when I worked at Xerox, which sold copiers, I didn't sell copiers. I sold zero radiography, which was the leading modality for breast cancer. And because I was the number one sales rep in the world for many years, a lot of 
headhunters, we call them, people of, of other companies are, are coming after you because they know how good you are. My second career job uh, was being the first black in the world to sell MRI CT scanners. And then my mm -hmm. third job was with Johnson & Johnson as a neurosurgical specialist. That's my background, folks. Think about that. <laughs> Zero radiography, MRI, CT mm. scan. Then uh, specialists for neurology, neurosurgeons. You know, that's my mm -hmm. corporate 20-year background. That's, that's what a lot of people don't know. You don't get those kind of jobs be, because you Beyonce daddy. You get right. those kind of jobs because you know what the hell you're talking about and you're at an extremely high level uh, because that's also medicine and science. So it's not just sales ability. I had to know my stuff. Speaking of um, the great icon, did you ever think when you were, cause you you have, people may just know, some, some of the young folks might know you as, you know, Beyonce's father. But like you are saying, you had this whole entire, you know, knowledge base, career path, educational path, background. But then does it shift for you? Like, when did you realize, and did you ever, did you ever think that it would be this? Oh, absolutely. And I, encourage, I encourage everyone that's listening today. I used to sit on that, uh, we had a uh, little hill in our backyard. Uh, and as a kid, I used to sit on a blanket and look up in the sky and see those clouds. And when you're a kid, the clouds look like they're low and you could make designs in your head. I used to dream. My mother used to encourage me to dream and, and dream big. And so I used to always say, as a kid, they would be like, knows what you want to be. I said, I want to be a businessman. That was my answer. Every time someone asked, what you want to be when I'm talking when I'm six, seven years old, I want to be a businessman. That's right. So as a result of that, at three, third grade at the Catholic school, can you believe that in Gaston, Alabama, I went to a white Catholic school? So in the third grade, mm -hmm. I saw candy. I saw candy. And, and you know, had a couple of dollars and turned that into $20. And then I got in trouble uh, with the nuns and had to write, <laughs> I will not sell candy about 500 times. And that was the end of that. Wow. But the point is, dream big. It takes the same effort for a big idea that it does for a small idea. So often what we do is we, we think small. We don't think big. So when it when did you ever think that when you had your girls Solange um, and Beyonce did you think that they would ever be as big? Did so you thought so you already knew like this was going to happen. You were assured this is what's going to happen, and you went and put the uh, steps to making that happen. No, not at all. And, and you know, interesting enough, uh, on that long flight, <clears throat> excuse me, on that long flight yesterday. I got to see uh, the Williams movie again, King Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I hold back on, on a lot of the uh, questions because we just finished my script for the Matthew Knowles story. So I don't want to give that all away now. But, but, what, I will, but what I will tell you that, that's completely different than King Richard. I was never that parent. And, and nor was my former wife. We were never that those parents who said, we want you when you grow up to be a doctor. Just like my mother never told me when I grew up, I had to be a businessman. She wanted me to find that passion. And I say this, I say this all the time. This will take a, a, a roll out of my, a, a note out of my movie, but if Beyonce and Solange had came to me and said, hey, dad, we want to be doctors, I would have said, OK, go to medical school. <clears throat> and when you finish, 
I would have bought a hospital. Think about that. <laughs> I want them to tell me what they wanted, what their passion was. And when they completed that task, I would have bought a hospital. That's a different way of thinking. Mm. And when mm. people ask, well, why are you guys successful? We've always thought like that. Uh, mm. When my former wife, she uh, raised the kids, got bored, and I said, what's your passion? What is that thing that excites you, energizes you? And she says, I love doing hair. I love doing makeup and fashion. And I said, go get your license. Look at that. And we'll start a hair salon. <clears throat> and we made our first million dollars in 1986. Atlantis Hair Salon. Anyone that's over 40 and Get Houston. out. And we owned the hair salon for 17 years. And at one point had a wow. staff, staff of 25. Well, just for the record, Beyonce was only four years old. So we made our first million dollars. I guess Before. I guess Beyonce made that million dollars for us at four. Uh, that's how hilarious some of the things that I that I hear. Right. Uh, right. Ah, look at that, you guys. New information. You heard it right <laughs> from Dr. No's mouth. He was a millionaire before. Yeah. He was I, new. Listen, we would have never known. Well, he, when you're the number they one were millionaires before. When you're the number one sales yeah. rep in, in the world and you're selling a $5 million piece of equipment, the commissions are quite high. Um. <clears throat> mm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, and, and I think those are sometimes the misconceptions. We just think like success happens overnight and it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it has tr traces, it leaves clues. And, you know, I was just really interested to hear the story because I never knew, I really never knew, but I've always, you know, people admire something, but sometimes they don't really know what they're even admiring and how it got to be that point. So Thank you for your transparency and thank you for giving us a little note, a little cliff yeah. note from your book. In which point of life did you see? I mean, again, that goes so back to. We, we're going to go into questions. Go ahead. I was looking at the question, but what point did I? Oh, know? okay, okay, okay. Uh, again, we, we wanted our kids to find their passion. Excuse me, guys. That I, is so great. On my, on my teeth. We wanted them to find their passion. Yeah, you're fine. So we exposed them to a whole lot of things. You know, we exposed them to NASA in Houston and taking them to tours there, to the medical system, uh, taking them to tours there, uh, a lot of museums, art, a lot of theaters. Um, we wanted them to, and we wanted to see what they gravitated toward. Again, it's this thing called passion, uh, the thing that made me, after uh, 20 hours of travel, come into this office and research for two hours, and then get up this morning and research for another hour so, so that I could talk to you today. It's that thing called passion, you know, because without that, you probably are going to fail. If you don't find that of passion, course. if you don't find that thing that excites you like that, that thing that you go to bed and wake up, and understanding that when you do find it, you don't work. You don't work when you live your passion. That's right. And that's the beauty of it. Amen. That's why it's so important. Find not your parents' passion, not your girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife passion for you, but find your passion. And your passion might just be that plant over there working in a greenery. But if that's your passion and you get up in the morning and go to bed at night thinking how I can make that plant grow better, you're going to have the most beautiful plants 
anywhere. Because what coexists with passion also is work ethics. And that's why you see all the people that are highly successful, they work so hard at it. You know, I'm talking Uber success. Can, can I show y'all what Uber success looks like? Is, is that okay? Uh, there's one slide I would like to show sure. you. Okay, because I don't think a lot of people know what Uber's greatness means. So Ashton, can you show that one slide, please? <clears throat> and then we're gonna go into question the answers from our audience. So I'm sure everyone knows what a decade is, 10 years. And I think it would not surprise any of you to know that in a decade, there, there's probably two to three million artists in the world. Two, three, four million artists in the world. In a decade, a decade, with these three, four million artists, Destiny's Child was number nine, Beyonce was number four for the whole music industry in the whole world for a decade. For a decade, from 2000 to 2009, in the whole world, these million of artists, Beyonce was the number one female artist. For a decade, for the whole world, millions of groups, Destiny's Child was number two in the whole world for a decade. That's called greatness. Yeah. You said that was greatness. I just wanted to make sure because your phone cut out. That, that's you said that was what, called. That, that is what it's called greatness. And, that, and that's why there's only a few people can do a movie like Venus and Serena. Uh, or uh, or the dad, Tiger Woods, uh, dad could do the same. Uh, Joe Jackson did the same. There's only a, that would be it. That had that level of greatness. Well, there's been people that's been good at, really good at stuff. But to do that is greatness. Mm. Amen. Okay, so let's go. Let's see. We got some questions here. For Dr. Knows, let's see, come to the. Okay, so someone says um, they're thankful, of course, that you've overcome cancer. Someone who says, Joyce, her sister died of cancer. Um, oh, let me come back down. Yeah, sorry to hear that. Um, complications related to cancer. Um, we have to beat the, how do you encourage innovative ideas? I don't know if you've already kind of gone through that. How do you encourage innovative ideas? Well, I, I think first I want to go back to that, uh, that, that comment on cancer. Uh, first, thank you. I was fortunate because I worked in that field uh, and mm. knew the symptoms. I was stage uh, 1A. Uh, I'm fortunate that I only take a pill a day. I only have two more years to do that. But we live in a different world of medicine, and this is what I want you to know. You have rights as patients. It's all about early detection. He who or she who finds it early lives a different life. If you stage 1A mm. and, and you find it then versus stage 4, the end result is not going to be the same. That's why knowledge is power. I encourage you to understand this new world of medicine called genetics. Each and every one of you on this call today should get a genetic test. Each and every one of you on this call today should today order. I'll even give you the name of, of a company, Invite, I N V I T A E, I N V I T A E, because now in the world of genetic testing, we can tell you if you're predisposed for cancer 
and tell you if you're predisposed for heart disease. It doesn't say you're gonna have it. It only say, like I'm genetic mutated. It only say that I have a high probability of prostate cancer. So I better change my lifestyle. And those things that cancer love, alcohol and, and over obesity, and lack of exercise, I better start doing that. If you get nothing out of this, save your life. Save your family's life. Amen. Early detection. We should not be dying like we are because we wait too late to go to the doctor. True. So I have to say. That's true. I appreciate that. That's real. Because we found a lot of young African-American women more so being diagnosed and dying of cancer quickly. So... There we'll make sure we'll put that link out there. In, in there you go with African American. I don't, I don't know what African American is. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm used to saying it. Absolutely, I, I have said that. So we have um, we have one more. We have another question. Um, go ahead. What you gonna say? No, I was just saying I was at the University of Cape Town, um, in South Africa, uh, room and graduate school, and uh, the question came up. I asked the question, do you see me as Black or African American? And three hours later, amazing debates and energy. Um, last time I ever used that word because I realized, <clears throat> and, and after I understood who we came up with the word, I have a lot of respect. Mm. Jesse Jackson is my frat brother, but I mean, you can't just grab hold to words and not understand what they mean and, and how. Uh, Africans view Black Americans is not in a lot of positive light. And, and so we just have to, again, mm. get knowledge and understand when we're saying the word African-American, who the hell are we talking about? Mm. That's true. I'm going to look into it. Is yeah. that someone's alarm coming up? Oh, OK. So we have a question from um, Detwan. He says and asks, in which point of life did you see her? I guess this was when we were talking about Beyonce um, and Solange. What point did you really see them taking this serious? Like, how did you know? Yep, we're staying right here. Is it because well, they said they wanted to or you saw something? Because of a, hopefully a good parent that understands that when my kids said that they... Uh, love softball ball and uh, baseball and one day they want to be a professional baseball play, play, player but then <laughs> but then but then when it's time to practice i have to tell them hey you know you got practice tomorrow then it's a hobby and, and so we have to understand the difference between passion and a hobby most people have hobbies that they get confused as a passion if, if I have to tell a kid to go to practice, it's a hobby. Because when it's a passion, they're going to make sure that I don't forget to get them to practice. It's as simple as that. We make, things, we make things very complicated when sometimes they're very simple. Mm. That actually goes into the next question. Someone says, has overthinking ever affected you throughout your life? And so what helped you to get past it? Are you That's an overthinker? No, 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 I'm a strategic thinker. Big difference. Okay. You know, Big overthinker, an overthinker might not have been completely strategic and they are overthinking because they're not mm. confident that they have come up with the right strategy. A strategist, when we come up with strategy and we go through the steps of strategy, we are now in a stage of implementation. I ain't thinking about it anymore. It's time to make it happen. Yeah. A lot of people, Okay. I call it talk to do ratio. So my question to you is what is your talk to do ratio? Because overthinkers have a very small talk to do ratio. They a talk, talk a whole to lot. do ratio. They talk a whole lot, think a whole lot, mm -hmm. but they don't do a whole lot. Look at that. The talk to do ratio, y'all. You heard that? 
Well, you can, um, you know, I, I have, have, go ahead. I have, I have five books and there's one that I, I really recommend, The DNA of Achievers, 10 Traits of Highly Successful Professionals. And that's where I whole, have a whole chapter on talk to do ratio, a whole chapter on leadership, a whole chapter on learning from mistakes, and, and, and a whole chapter on thinking outside of the box. We've been conditioned to be box in thinkers. Since we were kids, people told us, mm. you're not gonna be able to do that because you're black, or because you're a woman, or because you're a LGBTQ community, or because you live in poverty. Uh, you're not gonna be able to do that. So we walk all day inside of a box, box hitting walls. I mean, we're just hitting wall, bam, all day long. We go that way, bam, hit another wall. And guess who we want in our box? Another box in thinker. Because if I'm a hater, I want a hater in my box. Mm. I don't want no hater in my box. Uh, but the point, though, is, is not yeah. that it's, I'm not using an example. The point yeah, yeah, yeah. is whoever you are and, and, and your limitations, being a box in thinker that you've been conditioned that you can't do things. You're gonna want other people in your box just like you. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Let me ask, let me ask you this. Based on that, one of the other questions is: Do you? And I'm gonna ask it twofold because her question is: What do you do when you want to start a business but you don't have a lot of money? So, under resource entrepreneurs is who we support through our Roby program, resident owned business um, incubator, and so. You know, we're constantly, when you're talking bootstrapping and is it a money thing or is it a mindset thing? What advice would you give for, for entrepreneurs that only have a dollar in a dream? So first of all, have they gone throughout through the creative process? I teach entrepreneurship. I am an entrepreneur. I own several businesses. I just recently sold my catalog for over $10 million. I sold Music World in 2002 for over $10 million. I, I sold House of Daria and clothing line for over $75 million. And we started with zero, all of them. Absolutely mm. no money. It was an idea. And so first, have you gone through the creative process? The who, the what, the why? That's the creative process. Who is my customer? What is my product? And why should they buy it? Now you're getting me excited because you're talking entrepreneurship. That's my thing. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do so you think music is my thing? Y'all think I want to talk about Beyonce. That ain't my thing. I'm so proud of Beyonce. I'm so proud of salons, but I hope I've given them the skills that they can now take it and run with it. You said, but, you, but so in entrepreneurship, we're entrepreneurs. A lot of us, our students here are on this call. They're entrepreneurs with a dollar and a dream. And they think that maybe you need a lot of money to make this thing happen. You said it all started with just zero, but perfecting the creative process. That's where it has so to we, start. We got because in the hmm. creative process is a thing called business plan. And, and so you can't... Hmm. You can't raise money without a business plan. I mean, you can try. You're not going to be very successful, but you can try to do it. Will I come to me and tell me to give you $10,000 and you don't have a business plan. I'm going to be like, I don't think so. Uh, so if, when you go through the process and, and you understand, <clears throat> is this the right product? How do I scale it? Because Success is about scalability of a, a business. And maybe I have to do it in a strategic process of stages. Maybe I can't today just open full fledged. Maybe I have to do it in stages. This whole new digital world, you don't need money or as much money in a digital world. How can I digitize my, my company? Those are the type of questions. And, and then lastly, mm. I want to give each and every one of you a new word in your vocabulary, Larry. We talk about entrepreneurship. I want you to understand the word intra 
entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Intrapreneurship. That means you work at an organization and you run your department or you run your territory as if you own it. We need mm. equally entrepreneurs as we do entrepreneurs. See, entrepreneurship is a, again, a, a mindset. And, and we need people inside of corporations with that same entrepreneurial concept and where education goes wrong is we don't teach that. We teach everybody, you gotta be an entrepreneur. No, it's the same process for an entrepreneur as it is for an entrepreneur. Mm. That's good. That's good to talk right there. So, okay. So I have a question here. What would you tell your 20s, your, what you, based on you are, you're 70 years old now, what would you tell your 20 year old self? If you could tell it one thing or a few things. Well, I, I think that, and, and I talk about this a lot, I think there's three major ages in our lives. At age mm. 20, mm -hmm. at age 20, age 50, and age 70. Age 20 allows us to make a whole lot of mistakes, and we can recover from those mistakes. It's a time of finding ourselves, finding our passion, uh, and, and, and understanding and growing and learning when we make those mistakes. At age 50, typically you're married, typically now you're empty nesters. At age 50, you begin to have those corporate problems because at age 50, a lot of corporations want to get rid of you, quite frankly, because you cost too much. Uh, at age 50, mm. you begin to have health issues. At age 50, because now the kids are, are gone, now it's just me and your mama. And, and now we got to see if we really love each other or even like each other. So you have a lot of marital issues at age 50. At age 70, which I'm proud to be on, all of that should be behind yeah. you. Should be behind you. So, Age 20 is a great age to, to begin to understand and take risk and understand and finding that passion. That's at age 20. Mm. And, and, you know, at age 20, you know, age 20, I'm a junior in college. That's when I transferred and went to a black university because I didn't have that black experience. And for me, it was, I had it from being one of the first Blacks in the civil rights movement, but I had never really lived culturally around Blacks. And I, and I will say a lot of my success is that multicultural dynamics that I went to school with white kids and I then culturally I am Black. And so I have a well-roundedness of being able to um, communicate effectively. Uh, I go to Harvard every semester. There's a, a course called Cultural Intelligence, CQ, understanding different cultures and how they think. All of these things become important in success. When I was over in, for nine days, my wife and I, we, we were in, uh, um, Italy, culturally, how Italians communicate, uh, culturally, how the times that they eat, I mean, they eat dinner at nine, 10 o'clock at night, and then they drink and they don't start until later in the morning. I mean, it's a lot of things culturally we have to understand. And at age 20, you should be doing that. You should be traveling. You should be doing those things that you understand different cultures. Mm, that's good. Um, we're almost at the end of our interview. Um, and I want to wrap this last question up because it, one of the things I see common with you is you have, as an entrepreneur, would you agree that you can have multiple or you should or would have multiple businesses? You said you sold all of these different businesses and they're all different. 
So is it because you bring that mindset of business to everything you do and you're able to scale to these degrees? Is it because of who you are that you're able to scale? Now, I know based on our conversation, it's definitely what you know. Because That's a very um, good question. I'm glad you asked that question because it's about transferable skills. Mm. The, only thing, look, the only thing that's different, so medical de devices, uh, hair salon, uh, clothing line, record label, um, a professor, mm. professor. The, the only thing is different is the product. The, the skill set of success, uh, understanding marketing, understanding dif distribution, understanding budgets, understanding the knowledge of your product, that's all the same. Mm -hmm. it's, this is just transferable skills. And people that are successful, that's why you can see someone that could be the president of, I don't know, I'll make up something that could be the president of a national YMCA and then could be the president of a university. Uh, the products were different, but the yeah. skill set to run a multinational organization, the skill set is the same. And that's what we should be teaching is our skill sets. But we have to have professors who also have life experiences and not just book experience. Absolutely. I'm so glad you said the um, transferable schools because in our new program, we have recently got some um, funding from the Department of Employment Services here in the district to do a, you know, work they call work readiness life skills. But we have an emphasis on this upgrading this resume by having these work from anywhere skills. So it's called ROS. It is our work readiness program. And we want to make sure that if you guys are out there, if you're in the DC area and you know anyone that may just need some tweaks, I'm big on the, the technology skills, just being able to, you know, um, how do you say, ante up, like to me, working from anywhere, I'm actually in Louisiana, but, you know, my skills, whether it's planning an event, whether it's doing an email campaign, marketing campaign, reaching out, building those relationships, that networking, we want to make sure that our families get those transferable skills, and I, I don't know, I just, I just want to make sure that you guys that are listening, you guys are in our summer youth programs, you guys are listening, listen to there's some trends that he's, he's talking about. And a lot of those things you're definitely going to find in our programs, whether it's our work readiness, Ross program we have coming up, our entrepreneurship program, which we hope that Dr. Knowles will come back and speak to our entrepreneurs for sure, because that would be totally dope. Um, because... You got me going back to the drawing board. Like, seriously, you got me going back to the drawing board and just sitting down. I think sometimes we want results or we want this quick fix to something and we didn't do the work. We didn't put the work in. And for you to have the success you have, sometimes it's easy for us to chalk it off and say, oh, well, that's Beyonce dad. You know, he got money from her, but clearly through your story, that is so oh, no, 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 no. Beyonce got money from me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hello. Hello. Let's get it right. Let's get, Let's it right. get that correct. Let's set the <laughs> no. record straight. No, Let's set the record straight on that. We we Come grateful, on. grateful, and, and and very proud uh, that we uh, were millionaires uh, way before Beyonce's music career started. And and you know when she talks about Parkwood. Uh, we live in an upper black neighborhood in Houston. Um, mm -hmm. and so, but I, I, I don't want people to, to get it wrong. Made a lot of mistakes because when you are a risk taker and when you have a visionary, which are key things of success as an entrepreneur is being a visionary which means you have to get tremendous amount of research, like highly successful entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, research, research, research. They have the information and, and then they make decisions based on having 
the inflammation. And, and so you're going to make mistakes when you're a risk taker. But that's part of growth. That's part of success. The key is separating ego out of risk taking and making mistakes. And so I always like to give a definition. Um, I'm always teaching, uh, I always say that. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Ego, is, ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. And, and when you see people with mm. these demons, it's because they don't have the information and they want to no, deflect because they don't have knowledge and the information. Mm, that's powerful. Where, where are you teaching? I'm, I'm about to, what's, I'm going to sign up to whatever class you teach in. I'm well, I, I started Pepperdine. Um, you know, I start there uh, not not tomorrow, but next Saturday. But it's a graduate course, and it's not open. Uh, I do teach a music business course. Um, the next one will be uh, one I'm teaching here in Los Angeles is on artist development. It is a hands-on. It's only a few students. Um, I don't have a, I'm having so many discussions with different universities uh, to, to be a global ambassador. Uh, education has always been my thing. I love that. Even when you're a manager, uh, you're teaching, you're really teaching. Um, you know, even when I look at Destiny's Child, the, the young ladies, when they, we practiced, we used to practice failure. And what do I mean by that? They would practice not knowing when the microphone was going to go out or when the music was going to go out. We would even take it to a different level that we would take some of the buttons and loosen them or a zipper so that they were, might in their performance be a wardrobe mal malfunction. Uh, we would do some things with mm. shoe that the shoe would break. Practice failure. And, and, and these are the things in, in of greatness that you have to understand. You also have to practice failure and because failure and mistakes are gonna happen in our life. And when they do, you have to have your plan B already established, not be in crisis mode. Most of the time mm. you're in crisis mode. Now we're trying to figure out what to do instead of, well, if that happens, here's plan B. If I close my company, Today, I have a plan B and a plan C. Strategic. I mm -hmm. planned mm. 18 years ago the transition out of the music industry and to transition into education. Go back to graduate school, go back, get my PhD, write five books. I, I, I planned that strategy years ago. Just like four years ago, I planned a strategy to go into film and TV. And so in the next two years, you'll see film and TV projects along with academia. Mm. Oh, wow. So, I mean, I guess, I mean, if there's anything that I can say, because we are at the end of the time, if there's anything that I can say, I love the diagram that you put, education and knowledge, and how you stated that they're really different. They're not the same. But it was the education and knowledge in which you had that was the foundation for you to build everything else around you. Yes, and have parents that understood that, that uh, you know, didn't have the, the most education, uh, but certainly had some knowledge. Some knowledge. That they had Wonderful. gained. Uh, and, and that was very, very beneficial. Can we take one last question from the audience? I always like to do that. Because uh, normally it's the best, it's the best question of the whole whole day. Is that that, that one that somebody was thinking and didn't want to ask? Uh, I think we actually we got them all. Uh, someone, yeah. Let me just see. This was more like a comment. Once um, Swanequa Lassiter 
um, CEO of Safe Place Sitters, she was the one who asked about, you know, um, needing a lot of money. What do you do when you have well, a lot of money? I just saw one by I just saw one by Sabian. Uh, Sabian. It was it just what's the best up. piece of advice you've ever received? Yes. So what's the best piece of advice I've ever received? That's a received? good question. It is. I, I like that one. Um, and I just got this piece of advice about two years ago. And that is when you are the smartest one in the room, then you're in the wrong room. Think about yeah. that. You know, we like to say we're the smartest one in the room. No, that's not good because you should be in another room that's you're not the smartest so that you can learn. So I don't want to be the smartest one in the room. I, I want to go to a room where I'm not the smartest and I can learn and become smarter. Now you got all these questions coming in and you guys, why didn't you put your questions in earlier? We I don't know, this Russ. Amount of time. I, I don't mind asking, answering a couple of more. I, I don't at all. Nakaya, well, she, she said, what advice would you give a single black mother who is raising young women with no father to give fatherly advice? Oh, that's 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 a really a deep uh, emotional question. Um, let's come back to that one. I, I don't I don't really have a, a quick answer for that one. Yeah. Uh, what would you say your generation and today? What would your generation and today's generation have in common? Well, I think we have more co in common than people think that we 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 did. You know, it's it, it was all relevant. What yeah. we considered technology, we thought we had new technology when we had the transition, the, the transitional radio, and we thought we had new telephone, when we had the mobile telephone, you know, I, I didn't grow up with them, we didn't have mobile phones at all when I grew up, uh, we didn't have computers, we had encyclopedias, but when we got mm. those tools, we, we thought we had the latest technology. It's all about how we utilize the technology. So that's the thing we need to understand is you can have a technology, yet you don't understand it and know how to utilize it. And that doesn't mean always that I have to be able. I have people, I surround myself with people going back mm. to I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I have people much smarter than I am that do technology for me at my company. I, I have an assistant that's been with me for 20 years. You know, it's building a right team of people. And when you build a business, it's about building a team. And that's an aspect of entrepreneurship that in, in entrepreneurship is how to build a team because you have to have legal assistance. You got to have manpower. You have to have insurance, banking relationships, finance. You have to build that right team around you. Um, you have to deal with these three initials called IRS. Um, so, so you have to understand, you know, our number one reason for failure and most things that we do in life is the lack of knowledge. Yeah. I mean, we can pick anything in life and we can yeah. say, why did it fail? Health, lack of knowledge. Wealth, mm. lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Entrepreneurship, mm. lack of knowledge. Teacher, lack of knowledge. It, it really goes back to that core thing of knowledge. And, and part of knowledge mm. is education. And part of knowledge is getting experience and going to seminars and I applaud you, uh, the Bay Atlantic University, and I, I applaud Can I Live uh, for giving these kind of seminars because these are the things that are very helpful. It's when people can sit back and hear others who have accomplished and they can be, the, be real about it and, and yeah. share the mistakes that they made as well. Because I didn't get here by just successes. I got here more by 
learning from mistakes and making Amen. me a better person. I really appreciate the time that you've taken. And I don't know about y'all. I know everyone is in the chat and they're like, yeah, he's dropping gems. But real talk wholeheartedly, it hit home. It hit because what he's saying is not magic. It's hard work. It's knowledge. It's putting the work to find out how to do it. And so much so that I myself have been an entrepreneur who has struggled dearly. And because I just didn't have the knowledge. And so, you know, I thank you for just being transparent and open with our group. And, 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 and part of that, again, is, is research. I, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. When we started our, uh, our hair, hair salon in Houston, because I was in diagnostic imaging in a doctor offices, I realized that when you go to a doctor's office for the very first time, you fill out all this information, right? Then they take you into the room and the nurse asks you, why are you here? And you say, oh, I, I have a headache. Um, they take your tip, the nurse takes your temperature, uh, your blood pressure. Uh, she writes that information. Back in the old days, they would have a chart at the door. The doctor's never met you. He goes to the right. door, he looks at the chart. Oh, this person is, has headaches. Oh, the temperature has a fever. So he pretty much knows it's an infection of some sort before he even opens the door. When you go to a hair salon, what's the number one, number one thing that women really dislike about going to a hair salon? It's time. The number one thing that women hate about hair salons is the time they spend it. So if I can give you a quality service and reduce your time, and by that, if you're, uh, we were supposed to start at three o'clock, your appointment, we started at three mm -hmm. o'clock. And you were out of there at 4.30 and consistently could do that, people would play pay three times more if they were business people because business people and business women understood how valuable their time was. So we became successful because we did the research and we differentiated ourselves. Mm. The whole thing about entrepreneurship is what makes you different than your competition. And what made us different is you can go to headliners Girl, it's going to cost you a lot of money, but you're going to get in and out with a quality service. And, and that's mm. what is successful. Often we get, often we make life so complicated. And I, and I say to everyone listening, when you have folks around you that talks and it's always complicated, teachers that use big words, it's it's complicated. Run. Run from, <laughs> run from people like that because they're hiding something. They don't, mm. they don't really know it because people that really know it keep it very simple. Okay. Amen. I appreciate that. All right, you guys. Let's see. We got, okay, so three key takeaways. <laughs> If you could give us three key takeaways that we can leave. You have refreshed us. I believe one plant, one waters, but I feel refreshed. I feel, I feel, you know, shifted in some areas. So thank you for that. So rather than do a, a take of three takeaways, I'm going to give one quick last story. That'll be less than two. Okay. Um, I used to travel a lot uh, back uh, in the day in the music industry and I'm at LAX airport going down the escalator and there's a nun, um, she's from Mexico and she has a, a jar and it says, please give to the missionary. Man, when I tell you missionary was misspelled, but that's not the, that's not the issue. No. The issue is that she asks, please give to help others. And I've come to a point in my life where I'm not judgmental as I was when I was younger. Uh, there's a, a guy in Houston, because we also live in Houston. Uh, he says he's homeless. I don't know if he is or not, but he's at this intersection and 
and he has a sign that says, why lie? I just want beer. And when I tell you this guy has stacks of beer <laughs> and people like blowing their horn and giving them money, because he just said, why lie? I just want beer. You kidding me? No, life is this way. Life is this way. Why lie? I just want beer. Being authentic. You know, there's a chaotic part of all of us, but being authentic, people know when you not authentic. You know, if I was sitting here today and giving you BS, you know that. So I got a card from the, the nun I gave, and I have a, still have a, a we, we don't do business cards, as one of my students told me years ago, Dr. Knowles, you, you know, just take a photo. <laughs> you don't need business cards anymore. But back then, you, you had business cards, and I put the card in my, my jeans, and when I changed jeans, at some one point, because I was traveling, I might have 20, 30 business cards going from one pot of jeans to the other. And so I was at this car wash in Houston, and I finally read the back of the business card that the nun gave me. And that's what I want to leave you with. I'm a storyteller. The note said, pray not for a life free from trouble. Pray for triumph over trouble. For what you and I call adversity, God, the universe, Allah, whatever name, calls opportunity. And that has always stuck with me. Even the day, the moment I was told I had cancer, I remember what was on the back of that card. Pray not for a life free from trouble. We've been conditioned to pray no bad stuff is going to happen. And today, I want you to change your headset, change your thought process, change that mental poverty. Bad stuff is going to happen. I promise you that. But when it does, look inside of that and say, What's the opportunity inside of that? So when I had diagnosed cancer, the opportunity for me was to go around the world and share what happened. So just know when things happen, they, they're going to be bad stuff. But look at the opportunity. And that's how we become better. Because tough times don't last. Yes. We learn how to modify and adjust. COVID taught us that. Tough people do last. That's what I want to leave folks with. Mm. Thank you. He said tough people last. So triumph over the challenges. Thank you so much, Dr. Knowles. We really, really appreciate it. And remember, you guys, most of you guys are in our summer youth. You guys are went after some of you. If you guys are feeling like you guys want to enroll in any of our programs, the chat, the links are in the um, chat box. We definitely want to put a plug in for our new upcoming Adobe for all of our creatives. If you have an art skill, if you have you know, uh, and you want to monetize and digitalize that mo that art skill, we're really excited to be one of the only in this area offering an Adobe certified um, professional certification. So we only have a very few slots. So we're um, inquiring or enrolling for those programs. And let's not forget our um, Ross work readiness or our professional makeover it's paid training for you guys so let's get these new skills that dr Knowles was talking about let's get the education and the knowledge that he said was foundational and let's do this work and if you guys are not um if it's okay dr Knowles, i would like to go out playing um i'm a survivor by your girl um, because we are survivors and we, we are resilient people. And I'm going to go and check some of my stuff. I know I'm going to go back and watch this. I believe Bay, Bay Atlantic will have this on their YouTube video. Can I live? We'll share it on their YouTube video. 
We'll send it out, do some replays, watch it over and over again. Because like I said, success has traits. It leaves clues. And Dr. Matthew Knowles has shared many of those clues with us today. So without further ado, you guys, thank you so much for joining us. Again, thank you, Dr. Knowles. We thank, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I am grateful that I had the opportunity to co-write.